good. But for a moment there, I thought we were in trouble. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's time for me to tell you my story about what really happened. So, I'm just glad everybody's here. <laughs> and it's amazing how many people come and just see Butch Cassidy's. The state of Utah did a survey before they, um, before they renovated it for 400,000 and there were 70 to 90 people in the summertime that would just drop out. They counted. Get a seat, relax. We're telling stories tonight. My name is Gary Hobday, and I and my wife had the great good fortune to meet Marilyn on not one, not two, but three different cruises that we've been on together. I don't know how that happened, but it did. Marilyn is a storyteller. She loves telling stories. I like listening, but I'm going to tell you some stories tonight. We're very pleased to let you know that the Miller County Chronicle uh, and Progress newspaper is here tonight, so we're glad to have them here. And right now, Marilyn has asked me to, A, welcome you all for being here, and to thank some of the people that have been integral in getting this performance going. We'd like you to stand as we identify your group or you individually, if you would, please. So. Let's have all of our shareholders stand. Those of you who have made the commitment to storytellers, you're our shareholders. You're the ones that are helping to put this all together. You have not only made a time commitment, you have made a monetary commitment to make sure that this story gets told. We also want to acknowledge uh, Shauna Bagley, Principal of the School of Shana here. No. We want to thank Clive Romney. He's thank you, Clive. We want to thank Ed Johnson and his film crew that are here today. Making sure that this place gets back in here. Right now, what I'd like to make sure all of you do is turn off any cell phones or electronic devices that you have. Those of you who left them in the car, we have people going car to car collecting them, so not a problem. Like I started out earlier here, we are telling stories. Not just me, not just Marilyn, but our entertainment will be telling you some wonderful stories as well. I got a chance to listen to them while I rehearsed it. You're going to have a wonderful night. But you need to sit back, relax, get comfortable. And what I'm going to ask you to do right now is... Close your eyes, sit back, relax, and let me pretend to be Butch Cassidy and tell you my story. 
Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's time for me to tell my story about what really happened. There have been endless lies about my life as an outlaw, and it is time to set the record straight. The Pinkerton Detective Agency made my life a living hell. I tried to go straight many times, but being hunted made for desperate times. Just when I thought we were safe, the Pinkertons found out about our escape to Bolivia. I always felt like they came after me while I was down, and that their aim was to keep me down. We had to liquidate everything we owned on our ranch in 1906 in Bolivia, because they knew where we were, and we needed to sell off everything so we could again escape. We went on the run again. Etta had had enough by this time. She didn't like being hunted, so she went home. I did not blame her. Me and Sundance had to move fast or we would be dead men. We waited two weeks for a boat to take us down to Pernambuco. From Pernambuco, we had to wait a month for a boat to Europe. We left our ranch in 1906 and arrived in Paris, France, and stayed there through 1907. We were safe at last. We toured Europe before we returned to the United States. Thanks to our friend Percy Siebert, the head of the Concordia Tin Mines in Bolivia, everyone thought we were dead. I had saved Percy's life on many occasions, and he was repaying the favor. He also knew how sick of the outlaw life we were. Later we heard that Percy told the authorities that two bandits had been killed and that Percy said that two American bandits were me and Sundance. From November of 1908, the world and the Pinkerton Detective Agency thought we were dead. We would let it be that way. Being in Paris seemed like a dream. We could finally live life without fear. Now, let me start from the beginning. My folks came to Utah in 1856 from England and settled in Beaver in response to Brigham Young's call to gather his army. They were hard-working Mormon pioneers with so much love for our family and each other. My parents, Maximilian and Ann Parker, had a love story all their own. I am the firstborn to our family. My mother gave birth to me April 13, 1866, on the kitchen table as many pioneer women did then. My mother and father were so good to me. I came from a loving family, and I loved my folks, especially my angel mother. One thing I know for sure, they would do anything for all of us kids. I am grateful to have a family with many children. I had to work hard and take care of my brothers and sisters. My family loved me, but Ma loved me the most. Her favorite name for me was Roy, not Robert, my given name. The baby in our family was born in 1879. His name was Ebenezer Maximilian Parker. Father bought a 667-acre ranch in Circleville. And we loaded up the wagon, horses, and cattle, and seven children, and me being 13 at the time, and went through Bear Valley to Circleville to our new home. There were nine in our clan, and Mom and Pa started over to make a better life. Life had not been easy with so many children to look after, and settling into a new place as well. I could see that Mom had her hands full. One day, my mother, who was a small woman, I wanted to lighten the mood. So I picked her up and sat her on the front of the kitchen table and yelled, Come on, kids, bring on the crown. Ma's the queen. My brothers and sisters giggled with laughter. We all had a wonderful time. My grandpa was a Mormon bishop, and I had been raised right by my folks. The trouble seemed to follow me. At 13, I walked into town to the store to buy a pair of blue jeans. The store was locked, so I just figured I'd let myself in and, and leave a note for the general storekeeper, promising to pay. But he did not find any humor in that situation. He called the law and swore out a complaint against me. The judge let me go, but from that day on, 
I felt resentment towards anyone in authority. At age 15, I went to Penguins to a church dance. I had my eye on a girl, and we were getting along real well, dancing and getting to know each other, when another fellow tried to take her attentions away from me. We started to fight. I knew I had broke his jaw and nearly killed him. I was so mad. I had used my pistol, and I should not have done that. I took off that night on my horse, afraid the law would arrest me for nearly killing the kid. The next day, the law came after me. But I had a good horse, and I went as far south as Red Canyon before I saw the posse coming. I had my horse down in the wash, and we were on an old wagon road. I poked the gun up over the bank when they rode up, and I told them to get back or I'd blow their heads off, and they went back. I went on my way, and then I heard the posse coming again. So I hid behind some rocks, and when they got in sight, I started shooting over their heads and yelling, and they went back to Tanker. Then I came into the Tropic Cannonville area, and I, I lived on a ranch about four miles south of Cannonville with a fellow by the name of Bill Leeds. He was kind of an outlaw himself. I heard several stories about Bill. You know, I thought the law was going to get after me again, so every morning I got up early and settled my horse, and I was ready just in case. We would meander the ghost-like path that began in Mexico and ran through Utah and ended in Montana. We had all the hideouts and ranches covered, like the Carlisle Ranch near Monticello, where ranch owners seemed willing to give us jobs, even though they knew we had a reputation as outlaw cowboys. The Carlisle is where me and the boys camped out for two nights before and after the Telluride Hobo. We were close to Robber's Roost. After Telluride, folks knew who we were, and we made all the papers in the area. During this time, our, whole, our gang established our getaway hideout in the Hole in the Wall in central Wyoming. The law knew if we made it to Hole in the Wall, we were safe, and they would be dead men if they ever tried to enter. It was 1890 when I bought a cattle ranch near Dubois, Wyoming. We were never successful at raising cattle because we were so busy stealing. I became romantic with Ann Bassett, a rancher's daughter at Browns Park in 1894. Her father, Herb Bassett, supplied me with fresh cattle and horses. Everything seemed to be going my way. That year, in 1894, I went to prison for receiving a stolen horse. The darkest day of my life. I entered the Wyoming State Penitentiary, July 15, 1894. I went to jail for two years for receiving a stolen horse. I did my time and got off for good behavior after 18 months. Life in prison made me vow never to get caught ever again. My days were gloomy and downright depressing. My mind was made up. We would get better at robbing and getting away with it. Ann Bassett joined me in Robber's Roost early in 1897, and sometimes we got along, sometimes we didn't. Elsie Lay and his girlfriend Maude joined us. We all lived there like one happy family until I decided to send the women home so we could plan our next robbery. Me and Lay ambushed a group of men in a mining town outside of Castle Glen, excuse me, Castle Gate, Utah, on April 21st, 1897. They were carrying a payroll for the Pleasant Valley Coal Company from the railroad station to their office. We got $7,000 in gold coins and took off for Robber's Roost. Our most famous robbery was June 2nd, 1899, when we robbed the Union Pacific Flyer near Wilcox, Wyoming. We were famous and lots of lawmen were after us, but they never did catch us. We escaped to the hole in the wall, by the way, my best friend and companion, Elsie Lay, shot and in 1925. I was a successful businessman in Spokane, Washington, and desperately wanted to go to Circleville to visit my family. I knew they thought I was dead, and it just didn't feel right for them to think that when I'm alive and well. I borrowed a friend's Oldsmobile sedan and drove to Circleville. I went straight to the old homestead. The cabin had been abandoned, but I saw my brother Mark out in the fields. We had a happy reunion. He told me the sad news about my mother's passing in 1905. 
and told me how she died of a broken heart because of my outlaw ways. I did not want to hear that. I had caused my mother's early death. Feeling regret, I did my best to carry on. At least I was home. Mark took me into the town and we went to my father Maximilian's home. We walked up to the house and Dad came out. At first he didn't recognize me, but as soon as I smiled, Dad knew instantly that it, I was his boy. We hugged and cried in each other's arms for a long time. Then we went inside to visit. Dad called Lula, my sister, and told her to come over and bring food for all of us. Lula rustled up plenty of food and put her children to bed and came over to Dad's house. It was a shock for Lula to see me alive. She had heard so much about me over the years, but we had never known each other. We stayed up all night visiting. I know not only had my family back, but I got to know my sister Lula. I told them that I had a wife and a son and I lived a good life. They asked me how I escaped and about my facelift in Paris, France. They could see that my nose, my ears, and my jawline had been altered, but said, Dad said, you cannot take away that smile or the voice. Dad said, with or without surgery, he would have recognized me. I explained to Dad, that is why I settled in Spokane, Washington. I did not want to come back to Utah. The risk was too great that someone would recognize me. They asked why everyone said that I died in Bolivia. My only explanation is I heard Percy Seward from the Concordia Tin Mines told us uh, said that the two American bandits that died in November of 1908 were me and Sundance. He knew how sick the outlaw life we were, and I had saved his life on many occasions. So first he lied to put an end to our running from the law. And I was happy to let everyone think we were dead. I stayed for two weeks and went camping in my favorite place on the ranch. Tom's Cabin in Little Dog Valley. My brothers came with me and we sat the horses and went to camping. That was the safest thing we could do, not to be seen around town. We went into the mountains and camped and hunted and made up for lost time. Those two weeks were the happiest times of my life. The happiest times of my life. It was good to be home. However, the time had come to go back to Gertrude and Billy and I Felt pressed to go back to work. My heart was with my family in Circleville, but my family in Spokane needed me there. I had a lot of time to think and reflect on everything that had happened in my life, and all I know is I survived, and I have a good life now. Sometimes I wish I could turn back time. I, I wish I had not broken my mother's heart. I could not hold back the tears, and I, I thought of my angel. She loves me no matter what, and I would just come home and paid the price for hurting that boy at the dance. Life would have been so different. There was nothing I could do about the past. So I resolved to go home and be a better man. By this time, Gertrude and Billy knew about my true identity as the famous outlaw, Butch Cassidy. And they did not want anyone to know. They kept my secret, and we lived a normal life. I had talked about the 1929 Great Depression and it hit the world and I lost my manufacturing business. As I said, I barely saved our home and Gertrude went to work as a librarian. My self-confidence was shattered. I had so much courage as an outlaw and, and going to Paris, France and having a facelift was one of the toughest decisions of my life. But here I am, unable to support my family. My relationship with Gertrude deteriorated. I could not find work, so I decided to go back to places Sundance and I had earned some gold coins from our robberies. I headed to Lander, Wyoming, where I, I knew I had money hidden. When I arrived, I met Will Boyd, the brother of an old girlfriend, Mary Boyd. He recognized me and went to get married. Mary and I had lived together from 1895 until I went to prison, and, and she married another man and had a family. Now she was a widow. The spark was instant. We knew it was wrong, but we felt as if we had a second chance. We stayed together for several weeks. None of the money I had hidden was there. The only other person that knew about the money was Sundance. He had to have taken all the gold coins. Me and Sundance made a vow not to contact each other, and being a man of my word, all I could do was go back home. 
I went home to Gertrude and Billy and started to try and figure out ways to provide for my family. I began writing stories to sell the magazines. I had visited with Matt Warner and his family in, in Price, Utah. Matt told me that he had sold a story to Cosmopolitan Magazine. More stories started to flow out of me about my outlaw life, and I, I wrote Jim Kennedy Prospector and Frank Morley. After I wrote several stories, I, I tried to sell them to whoever was interested. I could not say I was Butch Cassidy, and the stories about Butch Cassidy's life, my life, were never published. Again, I felt like I had failed. From 1936 to 1937, Gertrude and Billy and I had accepted the fact that she would need to continue to support our family, and Billy would live with us for the rest of his life. He worked as a janitor, but was not capable of living on his own. He needed help and care. I was getting restless again and still wanted to find the stashes of gold me and Sundance had buried. I wanted to try one last time. I headed to Tropic, Utah and met with a fellow by the name of Wallace Ott. Another friend of mine introduced us and it was good to tell someone about my outlaw life. We talked for hours and hours. I brought Mary Boyd with me, and we continued our secret romance. Suddenly, I was not feeling well, and I had to kiss my old sweetheart goodbye and return home to Gertrude and Billy. Mary wanted to write me, so I gave her my home address and my business address, where I used to have my manufacturing company. We said our sad farewells, and I headed home to Spokane. Life had frozen in time, and nothing had changed when I returned home. Gertrude and Billy were both still working. I went to the doctor to see why I was feeling so poorly. The news was the worst possible diagnosis. I had stomach cancer. Gertrude and Billy were devastated, and the first thing I thought was, I must write to Mary and tell her that I am ill. I had told Mary if she wrote to me, she'd send her letters to the business address. Instead, she mailed the letters with very romantic overtures and worries about me to my home address. My health was deteriorating quickly, and Gertrude's and my love had ended years ago. I had been sleeping on the couch for quite some time. I was half out of it when Gertrude announced that she had read Mary's love letter. She was hurt beyond words, and I, I was the one to blame. She called an ambulance to take me to a government nursing home. Nothing I could do or say. To change her mind, and the ambulance arrived, and so I went along. The locals in town called the nursing home where I had been moved, the poor house, because folks that cannot afford a better place end up there. The conditions were awful. It was July, and I was put in the attic. No one gave a damn, and I, I could have died of neglect. I called a couple that Gertrude and I had been friends with for years and told them to get me the hell out of that awful place. They came and picked me up and drove me to my sister Lula's house in Circleville, Utah. If ever I believe there is a God, it is then. I could not have survived that nursing home and that I had ruined my marriage and destroyed my family. My life was in a mess. And I only had my dad and sister for support. I knew the end was near, so I gathered my family around me and let them know my wishes. We shed a lot of tears knowing that our time together was short. My father, Maxie, had failing health, and Lula had me and dad to take care of. She did not complain and went about taking care of everything that dad and I needed. It was not easy to stay in the house all day, but I could not risk the neighbors finding out that I had come home. Staying inside was my only choice. Dad and Lula did not want to have to explain the stranger staying in her home. My father, Maxie, and my sister, Lula, now knew of my wish to be buried at Tom's cabin in Little Dog Valley. That place is my favorite, and I have so many wonderful memories of camping there with my brothers. I wanted to be buried where I had the best time of my life, and I felt safe at last. I asked Lula and Dad to please bury me with my head to the south and my feet to the north, so when I awoke from my sleep, I could see the north star. 
I explained that the North Star had always been my guide when I was a cowboy. I knew it would always be my guide to guide me home. He promised they would grant my dying wish. A few days later, I passed from life on Lula's back porch of a heart attack. It was the end of the road for this old fellow. My family honored my wishes and buried me at Tom's cabin in Little Dog Valley on our family ranch. I look forward to seeing my angel mother again. And to finally say, I was sorry. I woke up and I saw the North Star and I was home. Home with my maker and ready to be before my God and beg for his forgiveness. I am home. Thank you for being patient. And Marilyn, I know that you would like to share some information uh, about what we're going to be seeing in this documentary. So again, please welcome Marilyn. took a picture with their backs <laughs> and it's in the book. So, you know, I asked Clive to sing Amazing Grace for me at the end of the performance because truly it's God's grace that we have found Butch Cassidy in the Sundance game. I know that there's a guidance in this world. There just is. And why me? I actually found out about four years ago in St. George when they opened up the new genealogy library that I am Butch Cassidy's 13th cousin once removed on my father's side. How about that? I'm related to Butch Cassidy. I didn't think to ask if I was related to Sundance, <laughs> but I can go back and do that. Oh my goodness. That story that Gary just read is the true story about Butch Cassidy. How many people believe that they died in Bolivia? Not anymore. Not one! <laughs> On my headstone will say they did not die in Bolivia. <laughs> I remember going to church and I had my books and I was talking about somebody and this fellow came up to me and got right in my face and he said, get over it! They died in Bolivia! Okay. <laughs> I had just filmed for KSL Channel 5 News because we exhumed the body of the Sundance Kid in the Duchesne City Cemetery and the next week he came up and he apologized. <laughs> they were clever, weren't they? They got away with $2.5 million in our money today. Can you even imagine? They were hunted. They're, the people in their game were dead in jail. It's like there was just the three of them left. So that's what you know. So why would I even care? I mean, we you ask me that question too. Why do you even care about pushing someone? Well, first of all, let's go to the movie. Who doesn't love the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid with Robert Redford and Paul Newman? It's a classic. It's made like, it's made like $2 billion over the last 50 years. The song, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, 
made, sold 2 million copies just the first year. So I've been on this adventure. And I used to make Mommy. movies. I ended up in Medford, Oregon, working for the company that made the Wilderness Family movies across the Great Divide and Wind Walker. Wind Walker was with an LDS um, author, Blaine Jorgensen. He lives in St. George. And I loved the book Wind Walker. I told the president, hey, this can make a good movie. It was made for less than a million, and it made $200 million the first year. They called it a phenomenon. And I go, Oh, that was my idea. <laughs> and a lot, and he, the president got greedy. He didn't pay anybody. We left the company. We had to start over. And we had like an awakening in like 1995. And I go, wait a minute, my ideas for movies make $200 million. So why don't I form a company? And my, my son and I was a single mom. I left my husband in 1989. And we loved Robert Redford. We were always bumping into Robert Redford. I met Robert Redford. I interviewed for a job with Robert Redford. We idolized Robert Redford, <laughs> to say the least. And we heard him on a documentary. And he said, I'm just a storyteller. And oh. Let's call our company Storyteller Productions. But we wanted it separate, Storyteller Productions. And then there are lots of Storyteller Production companies. So we put by Marilyn Grace. So I learned, and I got bitten by the showbiz bug. And we got to go to Trolley Theaters um, December 20th, 1976. And we premiered across the Great Divide. That little film was made for 700000 made $42 million, and it was a period piece. We got to go to, um, it's now Joseph Smith Memorial Building, but it was the Hotel in Utah. We got a limo. I got it for a coat. <laughs> we had the stars. We got up and say, welcome to our show at Trolley Theaters. And we introduced the stars, and we had a meet and greet afterwards. And it was like, I got bitten by the showbiz bug. And when I was single and looking for my career, I read a book called The Passion Test. And The Passion Test says, what is the most exciting, important moment of your life? And I said, premiering across the Great Divide, December 20th, 1976. And in The Passion Test, it says, now do it again. Guys, We've done it again. Can you see that? Just one idea. Thoughts become things. So this is amazing that we actually have done it. These wonderful shepherds, great, you know, um, Debbie and Gary came all the way from Bay of California just to be supportive. He did the voiceover for us. It's beautiful. You know, we've got, you guys, you know what, we've all contributed. Do you understand? This is not my company, it's our company. And we're here to celebrate. I, I just want a little celebration because literally on Monday, we will have our books on Amazon, our documentary on Amazon. We get to go to all the New York talk shows and we get to tell the world. And I, our company holds the movie rights. And we've got Colin Ray singing the music. We've got B.J. Thomas singing the music. I think the happiest day of my life is on Facebook. I messaged B.J. Thomas, and he gave me his personal phone number and email. Now, how cool is that? <laughs> I told everybody. <laughs> so we are going to tell everybody we've got a book deal coming up. And we're going to make the movie, the continuing story. So everything you heard was people coming to me, sending me the Wallace Art interview. This is the true story of Butch Cassidy. Do you see that they didn't die in Bolivia and they went to Paris, France and had a facelift? And it's the first time you've ever heard it, right? We are here making history. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you something. A cute story about me. <laughs> I, uh, 
You know, this has really been a journey. It's been a lot of hard work. It's been 23 years. So people who don't know me, people that aren't in the VIP seatings that aren't our wonderful shareholders, this has been a long journey. And it's not been easy, but now it's like it's all worth it. You know what I mean? We have truly crossed the finish line. More for Clive Snow, we got rained out over at Bridge Cassidy's Ford at home. And everybody is getting to feel the excitement it's building. So it was my birthday, August 26th, it's on Wednesday. And finally, after 10 days in the heat in St. George, we got the documentary done, we got the copies. And I came home and I took care of business and then I finally just scooted in here at the last minute and got everything set up with the people to get it set up. It's just been so last minute. But on my emails, my daughter had sent me a birthday video. And yeah, my birthday was Wednesday, but I opened up at 11.30 at night on, on, uh, on Friday night, which was just last night, and she sent me a, a birthday video. And all of a sudden I open it up, and this gentleman comes on and he says, Happy birthday, Marilyn. Instead of a cake, we have Donnie Osmond. <laughs> legs crossed on a table with all these presents in around and all of a sudden he goes, happy birthday, Marilyn. <laughs> and he had all these dancers, happy birthday, Marilyn. I just cracked up. This is my life. Funny things like that happen to me all the time. And my sweet daughter lives in the Hollywood. She's not a member of the church. It's even the story behind it's even funnier that she, who doesn't even participate in the other church since me, Donnie Osmond, <laughs> for my birthday. So now I really want to get into the meat of this because you're here. How come that, how come that story happened? Research. People handing me videos. People telling me stuff. So we're going to go over the four areas and then there's five. I'm going to tell you the final resting place of Butch Cassidy right here in Circleville, Utah. That's pretty, I, my favorite word is bodacious. <laughs> it's pretty bodacious. I can't wait to tell you. So I'm going to get my book out. And oh, first I really wanted to, I just, I so badly wanted like the movie. But remember, what are some of the lines? Get enough dynamite there, Butch? Who are, Who are those guys? Oh, shh. <laughs> this thing's up over the cliff. We are here because of the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I literally watched Paul Newman pass away. I literally watched William Goldman, who wrote a pass away. I am praying Robert Redford <laughs> stays alive. He has our two books. He will be getting our third book. And he will be getting our document. Wouldn't that be amazing if Robert Redford played the Sundance Kid? Everybody keep that positive thought and pray with me, okay? So now we're going to go through the areas of discovery. Is our mic okay? Is everything good? Okay. She told them that her brother came back and visited the family in 1925. They didn't believe her. They just saw her as an old lady <laughs> that kind of lost her mind. <laughs> and they made jokes. There's behind the scene documentaries I watched. But if it weren't for Lilith's book, and I'm starting um, to literally, I'm literally ordering every single book. Uh, Butch Cassidy by Little Peregrine. I actually met Dora 
Dora Flack, before she passed away, who wrote the book for Lulu. Um, so I really wanted to pay tribute to Lula for her courage to do that. And she, I love, Afton Morgan gave us permission to go up um, to Tom's cabin and actually search for Butch Cassidy's body. And my favorite story about Lula is Afton said, come on, Lula. You, you know, you told us in your book that um, Butch didn't die in Bolivia. He came back and visited the family. Where is he buried? So she said, well, Afton, I could tell you where Butch is buried. But then I lie about a lot of things. <laughs> That's my favorite story. So the very first bit of evidence we got that William Douglas Phillips was Butch Cassidy was with Dr. John McCullough. And you'll see all the pictures in our book. So we have Finding Butch Cassidy in the Sundance Kid, Butch Cassidy Mormon Boy Dies in Utah, and The Secret Life of Butch Cassidy After Bolivians. That just came off the press on my birthday, August 26th. Now I'm writing another book called Butch Cassidy and Some of His Good Stories because there are so many stories. And then I'm the first person in history to prove with photo transparencies that Ann Bassett was at a place. And that's a fascinating story with a twist. So we'll write Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Romance at a Place. So we'll have five books. This book, this documentary, is a proof of evidence to be submitted to Netflix for a five-part series, and I want to go to Paris, France, where Butch had a face <laughs> And Bolivia, because Chris and Eddie have already went to the ranch in Bolivia. They're, they're, they sent me pictures, and they were so cute. They, they were sitting in the chair. I think Eddie was Sundance. Sun the tour guide was Butch, and... and uh, and you were Etta. <laughs> Chris was Etta. That was, a, that was a fun photo. And it's in the book, guys. Look at the end of the book, because you're in there. Okay? So now, Dr. John McCullough has a 40-year career at the University of Utah in anthropology. We, the family allowed us to exhume the Sundance Kid in the Duchenne Things Center. Is there anybody who remembers back in... 2008 or so, that on the news there was a body exhumed in the sun. It's on KSL Channel 5 News. Anyone? I hear some mumbling. You want to raise a hand? Nobody remembers that? We, and for some reason, Butch is just a bigger story. <laughs> Sundance is just Sundance, but the family knew he was a member of the Mountain Wild Bunch. They didn't know which one. They had no genealogy because he lied about his past, and we exhumed the Sundance kid. So we asked Dr. John McCullough to examine the remains and also do photo transparency. So you take a picture of Butch, and we've taken a picture of William Thaddeus Phillips of Spokane, Washington. And by golly, when you put them together, the eyes, ears, and everything matches but the nose, ears, and jawline. So that's historical. That is copyrighted with Storyteller Productions. And that, you know, you're, when we, we're going to have a book signing, and you, when we go to the table at the end, um, you're welcome to look at those transparencies of Sundance Butch and Adam, but we don't have the time right now. So that's our very first piece of evidence. Then the second piece of evidence is handwriting analysis, and this is real quick because Bren Ashworth is the world's largest private collector. He owns the most Butch Cassidy items. He owns the Bandit Invincible. He owns Jim Kennedy Prospector and Frank Morley short story. He owns the 1907 and 1908 Butch Cassidy letters. And he owns Butch Cassidy's gun and holster. I mean, he owns a never before seen picture of a, a young a Sundance kid. And so, Brent acquired in 2000 the Bandit Invincible and he took his Butch Cassidy letters and took it to an LA handwriting expert, guess what? It was a yes. So photo transparencies, yes. But he did go to Paris and have his face altered. Handwriting analysis, yes. Now, and Ben Ashworth has written a book called Show and Tell, and he so wanted to be here, but he had a family reunion, and 
we become buddies. We're looking for a signature of the Sundance Kid so we can change history. <laughs> we're, we think we found one in Buffalo, Wyoming. And um, I got to see the 1908 letter. I got to examine them. And it's just really fun been working with Brent Ashworth. He's actually in Provo, and he was in my mother's ward. And he, had, he lost a son. And my mother lived on the corner, and she was the first one on site when his son was hit by a car on his bike. So he loved my mother. I love my mother, June. And so we're really close friends. And we feel like we have a mission together, and, and we definitely do. So then we decided to go, OK, we got the photo transference. We got the handwriting analysis. Let's tell the world we've got Butch Cassidy, right? So August 26th, on my birthday, we went to Cruise Lady. And a lot of people here have been to Cruise Lady and on my cruise to the Eastern Caribbean, the Unsolved Mystery Cruise. Gary Hobday is brothers to Randy Hobday, our cruise director. So I would say, OK, fine, we're going to go public. We go to Cruise Lady in West Jordan. We have this wonderful event. Brent brings everything I asked him to do. He's got Elvis and Marilyn Monroe and JFK. And, and the half dime that Martha Washington um, donated her silver to make this half dime. And I Googled it, and it's worth a million bucks. <laughs> and we had the nicest time, and I got to give my lecture, and, and we were going to do cruises with Cruise Lady, but we ended up going back to, Garrett, to Randy Hop Day with Cruise Ladies, and, and um, there daily travel and cruise planners with Gary Hobday. And so we have this wonderful event and come back to Penguich and I found out about Steve Crosby. They said, you know, my shareholder said, uh, you, you gotta talk to this guy. He knows where Butch Cassidy's buried. So I gave Steve Crosby a call. And you can go on YouTube, you can type in Steve Crosby on YouTube. It's in our book. So you have the the picture, then you have the story, and then you go to YouTube, and he takes us up to Little Dog Valley on Tom's cabin, and he shows us where his cousin, D. Crosby, saw Butch Cassidy secretly buried July 20th, 21st, 1937. And to make a long story short, we, we kind of didn't let Butch rest in peace. <laughs> We went up there and started digging with it. I wish the Burr Handyman could be there. They're coming with us tomorrow. We're going with a group. We're going to film it. We're putting all the rocks back. We actually found two bones. One is human. The DNA experts, we paid like $7,500. We don't want to spend any more money. But that bone is looking like Parker bones. And it's in a very secret place, if you know what I mean. <laughs> So then we had Charlie and Melissa Wardle come up, and they just knew we were going to find which cast is great. We didn't find it. It was August 26 and 7. I actually spent the night up at Tom's cabin with Charlie and Melissa Wardle and her three dogs, and we filmed it. And we found a second one, which we were excited about, but there was no results on that. Then the Burr Handyman would say, Marilyn, we're digging a hole to China. Where, where do we go now? And I said, well, I, the only thing I could think of is cadaver dogs. So Joe Jennings brought his cadaver dogs up to Little Dog Valley, three of them. Gunny was Joe Jennings' dog. And he was famous for, do you remember when the piano guy's daughter fell off a cliff in Washington State and she passed away? Gunny was the first one to find it. It was so cool to see that they tested the dogs by taking frozen cartilage from a human. I didn't know they had that. <laughs> and then they tested the dogs under a rock and all three found the dogs. Then they all three went inside of Tom's cabin exactly where we found the bones. They verified 100% human remains were buried at Tom's cabin. So then the handyman, you know, knew which way to go. But then we found out from, we had a Travel Channel show, and that aired, and one of Sundance Kids' granddaughters called me and says, Marilyn, we got news. In 1979, that Butch was moved because Dee was digging for him with a backhoe, and we went down seven feet, and we found gun shells, and we found 
chips from the wood up there. So they definitely, we verified that story. We had a sifter, it was an, like an archaeological dig. And she said, we got news in 1979 that they moved Butch to Lula's backyard. I went out there and talked to this wonderful couple with these seven little children. I was trying to be discreet. I go, can I come to your backyard? Because that's where Butch died on my back row. Yeah, and I, and all of a sudden, one of the little girls goes, you mean Butch Cassidy is buried in our backyard? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to hurt you. And then it was a week, and I just said, okay, I'll be in touch. And they're like, oh, we're going to make this a bed and breakfast. <laughs> And then I went to a convenience store because I was delivering books, and if I was talking to the cashier, and he goes, and I know the final story. He said, when Lula passed away in 1980, and they were widening the road behind her house, they moved Butch Cassidy next to his mother in the Circle Hill Cemetery. You're the first folks ever, besides reading our books, to even hear that. We know the final resting place of Butch Cassidy. How cool is that? So, what an adventure I have been on up there digging. <laughs> Clive has had me working, <laughs> but I love it. This entertainment just makes us look so good. Having the documentary film just helps us so much because it's expensive to make documentaries. So. And I'm gonna now we've got the Burr handyman, Joe Jennings, the uh, the two human bones, like I say that we actually in the book is a chart of a drawing of what a human spinal column looks like. And Dr. McCullough verified the bone that we have is human. And with the testing, it said it shows Parker DNA, but we need more testing. We don't need to spend another 7,500. We got the touch DNA. Then we had eyewitnesses come forward. How many of you, raise your hands, because I'm having a hard time seeing. How many um, knew Alta Orton? Anybody out there? <laughs> you know Alta Orton from Penguin? There's a couple. Oh, good, good. Alta is a sweetheart. I, you, you know, Alta, um, I was running a home and uh, Jenny Orton came over and she was in Travel Channel and she was absolutely trying to, everybody in that town fell in love with Alta Orton because she made homemade bread and, and after a funeral I actually went and bought cards in the chess game because <laughs> I said I'm going to make homemade bread and play cards and have a chess game because she just made people feel welcome in her home, you know, and she just was a love. And she, at 14, she worked for Lula Parker Benson. And it was July 1937 when she saw the whole Parker family dress up. And she always suspected that they were going to Butch Cassidy's funeral. Now that's a pretty darn good eyewitness. And she was so charming on the Travel Channel. When I interviewed, I've got so much footage on my tour. And I said, what would happen if they found Butch Cassidy's Remains, body. Oh, they steal his clothes. <laughs> <Isn't that brutal? laughs> then I had a fellow by the name of Larry Smith and his wife Pat come to my home in Panguitch. I mean, in St. George, when I lived in St. George, and they handed me the Wallace Off interview. Remember when Gary Hobden was talking about meeting with Wallace Off? He gave me the exclusive rights to that. No one has heard the story that Butch beat up a kid at 15 in a church dance in Cambridge, and that's when he went on the run. This is so historical. We were capturing stories that no one's ever heard before. And then there was a handyman, Kenny Allen, and he saw he came to the house, and uh, living in Cambridge has brought me so many stories on this. I didn't feel like that God wants me here in this area. <laughs> And I, Kenny Allen saw my books, and he uh -huh. goes, oh, I actually went up to Tom's cabin, and I go, oh, you're kidding. And he says, yeah, I rode inside the cabin, rest in peace, Butch Cassidy, because my dad told me, and he was 94, and I opened up the book, and there was a picture of Kenny Allen and his dad's story that he knew was buried. And he said, rest in peace, Butch Cassidy. 
Then I got on Facebook a gal by the name of Kelly. She's not giving, I can't get a hold of her. She's just a busy little gal. She's raised in Circleville, but now she lives in Virginia or somewhere. And she messaged me. I quoted her exactly. Her grandma attended the funeral at Tom's Catholic for Butch Cassidy. Now that's pretty amazing. Then we drove all the way to Arizona with Greg and Judy Dory. <laughs> what a madcap adventure. It was like, we, we had Cindy Googled and we found his phone number and his address. We called his son. We went to the house. He was on another um, travel channel documentary with Josh Gates. And we actually, he's no longer living there. We found the nursing home. And after we interviewed him, he said, everyone in the family knew that Butch asked to be buried at Tom's cabin. That's another eyewitness. So that's all of our, all of our eyewitnesses. Now, Kirk Fulmer is here in Circleville. He is the sexton. So now that we knew Butch was buried next to his mother, I needed to get a hold of Sexton, and, I, and he was willing, Kurt Fulmer was willing to come to my house and let us film him, and he's the one who told us the story that his dad said, Butch wanted to be buried with his head to the south and feet to the north. You remember the movie, um, The Other Side of Heaven? It was a beautiful by, you know, Mitch Davis, and it was a Disney film, and I've actually been in correspondence with Mitch Davis. And the whole theme was, we're under the same moon. It was a romantic movie about meeting his wife and going on a mission to Tonga, and they ended up getting married and they have a wonderful love story. The movie was made about their life. When I think of the movie we're gonna make, I can see that the theme will be, I wanna be buried with my head to the south and my feet to the north, so when I woke up, I could see the North Star because that was my guide as a cowboy to come home. So we have had quite the adventure. So grateful to Larry Smith. You know, so grateful for all the shareholders. Steve Crosby, what would I, he, he brought me up there. We got lost for like nine hours. <laughs> and and I, I woke up one Saturday and I go, after Morgan will know where it is, it's his property. And so after Morgan took me up there, and then Steve Crosby, I showed, Steve Crosby where Little Dog Valley, Tom's cabin was, and then we videoed him, it's on YouTube, where he says that's where Bush was buried. So now for the piece de resistance, touch DNA. And in the book you'll see all the documents that Bryn Ashworth donated. We spent $10,000 a day, a total of $103,000. We have a DNA team with Susanna Ryan, Theron Vines of Pure Gold Forensics in Redlands, California. We have uh, Gloria Dimmick in State College, and we have Dr. Perlin and Bill Allen of Cybergenetics. So this is not easy stuff. And we have done it. We have, Brent allowed us to do the touch DNA, she wore a mask, she wore gloves, and we collected and I wrote down, I have a vision board and I have the little stickers and I said, I want touch DNA for Butch Cassidy matching Will and Thaddeus Phillips. I've written in my journal, I'm a faithful journal writer. And on March 10th, we received the documents. Jim Kennedy Prospector, the 1907 the 1908 letters match. This cannot be refuted. There are people that will try and discredit us. They can't. We have touched DNA. Those are the only two people. Jim Kennedy, William Thaddeus Phillips touched that, and the 1907 and 1908 Butch Castle is the only two people who have touched that, and it's part of our database. We have just changed history with science. Nobody can take this away from us. There's a fellow. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Brent Ashford's the one. Gee, Marilyn, I think we should do And I granted his wish. 
Now, Travel Channel came, we went to Butch Cassidy's Boy at Home, that was great publicity for us, but they did not give credit where credit was due. When Travel Channel found out we had to touch data, they asked me to do another story, and I said no. And I had the faith to raise the money myself, and this wonderful investor came forward. We have this documentary, it's fabulous. We have our three books. We're going to give you a little clip of it. You know, right here in Circle View, you can go to Lula's house, see where Butch died on the back porch. You can go to Circle View Seminary. You can go to Maxie's house, it's here in Circle View. I really think this is good for the state of Utah. It's good for the economy. It's good for everything. And that's where I took I took these pictures of the Circle of Cemetery having no idea that Butch was secretly buried next to his mother. Now we want to get a bigger documentary, do ground penetrate new equipment and scan that. Or we can just you know, I felt guilty, I felt like a hypocrite. Everybody wanted the Parkers have not been happy with me. I've gotten really threatening emails saying, let my relative be <laughs> and I don't blame them. I just wanted to tell the story, you know what I mean? So now I am so excited for you to see. It's just called a short, it's 13 minutes long, it's Gary Hop Days voiceover. And I'm gonna have people come up and help me put the chair away. And I'm so grateful I got to sit down. I've been so busy, my knees are hurting me. <laughs> so I'm gonna let the film speak for itself, and then afterwards we get this wonderful entertainment that makes us look good, and this will be in our final documentary. This whole thing will be in our documentary. Thank you so much! Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's time for me to tell you my story about what really happened. The Pinkerton Detective Agency made my life a living hell. I tried to go straight many times, but being hunted made for desperate times. Just when I thought we were safe, the Pinkertons found out about our escape to Bolivia. I always felt like they came after me when I was down. Their aim was to try and keep me down. We had to liquidate everything we owned on our ranch in 1906 in Bolivia, because they knew where we were and... We needed to sell off everything so we could escape. We went on the run again. Etta had had enough of being hunted, so she went home, and I did not blame her. Me and Sundance had to move fast, or, or we were going to be dead men. We waited two weeks for a boat to take us down the coast of Pernambuco. From Pernambuco, we had to wait a month for a boat to Europe. We left our ranch in 1906 and arrived in Paris, France, and stayed until 1907. We were safe at last. We toured Europe before we returned to the United States. 
Thanks to our friend Percy Siebert, the, the head of the Concordia Tin Mines in Bolivia, everyone thought we were dead. I had saved Percy's life on many occasions, and he was repaying the favor. He also knew how sick of the outlaw life we were. Later we heard that Percy told the authorities that two bandits had been killed and that Percy had said the two American bandits were me and, and Sundance. From November of 1908, the World and the Pinkerton Detective Agency thought we were dead, and we let it be that way. Being in Paris seemed like a dream. We could finally live life without fear. From 1906 to 1907, we lived the life of European gentlemen. We bought the finest clothes and dined in the best restaurants in Paris. Our money went fast with all the temptations in a foreign country. Sundance wanted to return home. He had a wife and children in Utah that he had been sending money to. With Edda now gone and the romance over, we made a plan to go home. In Paris, I learned about a plastic surgeon named Dr. Louis Ombredane. He taught plastic surgery at the hospital there and would do surgery on anyone for a price. In 1902, he became the head surgeon of the Parisian hospital in Paris. He taught surgery around the world and his skills were world famous. I contacted Dr. Oberdani and talked to him about changing my appearance. Sundance could go home to his wife, six stepchildren, and two daughters without any fuss. He had folks that would help hide him out and who would suspect that he was the Sundance kid with a wife and all those kids. He had not seen his family in 10 years, and he wanted to go back to his life in Loa, Utah. I decided to undergo plastic surgery so no one would recognize me when I returned. If I did not have surgery, I would instantly be recognized, and I was willing to do anything to keep my freedom. I entered the hospital and submitted to surgery to reduce my jawline and had my nose and ears altered. After three weeks of recovery, I looked in the mirror and I could see very little of my old self. So clever had the transformation been. Sundance did indeed go back to Utah and his family. He missed his children, especially his two girls. He changed his name to William Henry Long. He couldn't wait to return home. He had a second chance at life. We had one last photo taken together and vowed never to contact each other in fear of being discovered. We kept that promise. After leaving Paris, I would have to start a new life. I decided to go to Spokane, Washington. I always enjoyed the ocean and the Northwest. Upon my arrival, I needed a name that would give me a fresh start. So I went to the public library and found a young boy's name, William Thaddeus Phillips, who had died as a child. I took the identity of William Thaddeus Phillips. Now I had parents and a history in case anyone asked. I bought a home and found work. It was lonely but wonderful to be in a totally different environment. It is 1907 and the world is changing and I had to move with the changing times. I decided I needed to go to church. I dared not return to my Mormon roots because someone might recognize me. I couldn't take the chance. Besides, I, I like my coffee, an occasional drink, and I picked up the habit of smoking. I hoped to find a place where I could start over and change my ways. I believed in God and Jesus and it was my sincere desire to start over and be on the straight and narrow. I felt I needed to start by being with good people. I started attending a local church and made some friends. I met a lady named Gertrude Livesey, and we started dating. I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. It was nice to have a good Christian woman by my side. Now, I have always been clever with my hands, and I started the Phillips Manufacturing Company. I built up my business of manufacturing parts for the adding and listing machine. My enterprise was a success, and Gertrude and I moved to a lovely new home, and we had friends and business relationships in our wonderful town of Spokane. We both wanted a family, but after many years of trying, we, we finally agreed to adopt. How blessed it was to adopt a baby boy. We truly had everything we could ever ask for. Then in 1929, the Great Depression hit, and we lost everything. Everything we had worked for. My business failed, but I, I managed to save our home. My wife Gertrude took a job at the library to feed our family. I, I felt humiliated as a provider to be living off my wife. I borrowed a friend's Oldsmobile sedan and drove to Circleville. I went straight to the old homestead. The cabin had been abandoned, but I saw my brother Mark out in the fields. <laughs> we had a happy reunion. He told me the sad news about Mother's passing in 1905. He told me how she died of a broken heart because of my outlaw ways. 
I did not want to hear that I caused my mother's early death. Feeling regret, I did my best to carry on. At least I was home. Mark took me into town, and we went to my father Maximilian's home. We walked up to the house, and Dad came out. At first he didn't recognize me, but as soon as I smiled, Dad knew instantly that I was his boy. We hugged and cried in each other's arms for a long time, then went inside to visit. Dad called Lula, my sister, and told her to come over and bring food for all of us. Lula made plenty of food and put her children to bed and came over to Dad's house. It was a shock for Lula to see me alive. She had heard so much about me over the years, but we had never known each other at all. We stayed up all night visiting. I not only had my family back, but I got to know my sister Lula. I told them that I had a wife and a son, and, I, and that I lived a good life. They asked me how I escaped and about my facelift in Paris, France. They could see that my nose, ears, and jawline had been altered, but Dad said you cannot take away that smile or the voice. Dad said with or without surgery, he would have recognized me. I explained to Dad that this is why I settled in Spokane, Washington. I, I did not want to come back to Utah. The risk was too great that someone would recognize me. I stayed for two weeks and went camping at my favorite place on the ranch, Tom's Cabin in Little Dog Valley. My brothers came with me and we saddled horses and, and went camping. That was the safest thing we could do not to be seen around town. We went into the mountains and camped and hunted and made up for lost time. Those two weeks were the happiest times of my life. It was good to be home. My father Maxie and my sister Lula now knew of my wish to bury me at Tom's cabin in Little Dog Valley. That place is my favorite and I have so many wonderful memories of camping there with my brothers. I wanted to be buried where I had the best time of my life and I felt safe at last. I asked Lula and Dad to please bury me with my head to the south and my feet to the north so when I awoke from my sleep, I could see the North Star. I explained that the North Star had always been my guide when I was a cowboy, and I knew it would always be my guide home. They promised they would grant my dying wish. A few days later, I passed from this life on Lula's back porch of a heart attack. It was the end of the road for this old fellow. Our family honored my wishes and buried me at Tom's cabin in Little Dog Valley on our family ranch. I looked forward to seeing my angel mother again, and I could finally say I was sorry. I woke up and I saw the North Star, and I was home. Home with my maker, and ready to be before my God and beg for his forgiveness. I am home. Thank you for uh, inviting us to tell you some of our favorite stories that have something to do with Butch Cassidy. Thanks to Paiute High School Principal Shauna Bagley for making this hall available and to Tyrell Ivy for assistance above and beyond all reasonable expectations. Thank you, Tyrell. Or Tyrell. Thank you. And thanks for the generous support of the Utah Division of Arts and Museums the Mormon Pioneer National Heritage Area, Utah Pioneer Heritage Arts, Story Road, Utah, and to Snow College for creating this beautiful ensemble who will entertain you. Um, Kenzie, if you can advance to the next one. Thank you. They are, if I may introduce them, Vanessa Lee. <laughs> only, only pick it in. Haley Wilmore. Cade Thomas, 
Levi Wonder Village. Uh, Hunter Flick. And I'll introduce the tandem, Grayson and Lizzie Overy. Jordan Caswell. And on the sound console, Kenzie Wonderlich. And thanks to Storyteller Productions and Marilyn Grace, who is one amazing, determined woman, for inviting us here tonight. Uh, we would like to ask you to join us, and if you can give us a, a G, P and G. All right, think you can do a Amazing Grace with us? Mm hmm, because she really is Amazing Grace. Please join us. Amazing Grace. silence your cell phone, please do so. And we want to present from Snow College, Utah, the Union Story Road Project.
mountains of the west. And I saw them do their preaching, and I heard their stories told. Down the Saturday, I took them across the rivers of the west.
Riding hot and heavy with a posse on our tail, but my mind rests easy. My mind rests easy. Like the wind, we blew past Hanksville and through the gates of hell, where the earth conceals me. The earth conceals me at Robber's Roost, our refuge from the storm. 
robber's roost Where perfect plans are born No one dares to follow Cause the canyon's full of death and the posse knows it, the posse knows it And there's not a man among them Wants to dress as dead men dress And their faces show it, they know we know it Robbers roost, no lawman's ever been Robbers roost to come in The only place on earth cradled in these canyons arms Where I can feel at ease Nobody's gonna do me Elsie Lay and Tom McCarty, Matt Warner, Sundance too We'll go down in history, down in history As the wild bunch whose spirits live on at Robber's Roost Carrying on the mystery, the myth and mystery of Robber's Roost We never will be found Robbers roost, we dare you to come down.